The Lab on Digital Societies. Hello and welcome everybody to the next episode of our academic podcast, DLAB on Digital Societies. My name is Joanna Mazur. I'm an, ass an assistant professor at the Faculty of Management and analyst in DLAB at the University of Warsaw. And it is my pleasure to host today's episode in which we'll be talking about international data transfers. Every now, then, now and then we encounter headlines stating that this is the end of the internet as we know it, or that something will kill the internet. Schrems cases were one of such occasions when the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union that concerned international data transfers were presented as a game changer for the companies operating in the digital sector. However, time has passed and it does not look like the internet as we know it would end. Thus, to better understand what was the meaning of the Schrems cases, what do they actually change, and why the question of international data transfers is so important, we will today speak with an expert on this issue. Our guest is Dr. Laura Drexler, postdoctoral researcher at the Center for IT and IP Law at KU Leuven, and a lecturer at the Open Universität in Herlen in the Netherlands. Uh, Laura completed her PhD on the topic of data subject rights in international personal data transfers at the Brussels Privacy Hub at the Law, Science, Technology and Society Research Group at Vrije Universiteit Brussels. Uh, she published extensively in international scholarly journals, for example, on the topic of international data transfers as we might expect, considering today's topic of the podcast, uh, but also interplay between the GDPR and Law Enforcement Directive. Uh, she was also an assistant editor of the Oxford University Press comment, uh, Commentary on the GDPR of 2020, its update of 2021, and she will reprise this role for the second edition. So, hi, Laura, it's great to have you here. And let us begin with the most basic question. What are actually international data transfers? Okay, I thank you, Chana, first of all, for having me at this podcast. I'm always excited to talk about my research. The first question that you ask me is, it might seem simple, but it's actually already quite complicated. Um, as you may know, there is no official legal definition of what is an international personal data transfers. And for a long time, there was also not really decisive guidance on, on this question. Um, the data part has changed. Um, we got in 2021 um, by the European Data Protection Board a definition of transfers, um, which they made in the context of figuring out when does the GDPR apply to uh, entities outside of Europe and how does this relate to transfers? Because as you might think, like transfers and these extraterritorial applications, it's sometimes called there's a certain overlap and they wanted to resolve this. So that's why they offered a definition of transfers. This has been now finalized in February of this year. So um, for the European Data Protection Board, a data transfer is when we have a data exporter in the EU, uh, which has to be a controller or processor in the scope of the GDPR, who makes available personal data to um, another controller or processor outside um, of the EU. So in a third country, or that could also be an international organization. This is the definition of the European Data Protection Board. And if you look at it, you realize so far for them, it is only a transfer if you have controller processor exchanging data with other controllers or processors. So they're excluding um, cases where you have an individual on either end. Um, if you look at the case law of the Court of Justice, which was all we had before this guidance to understand this question, you wonder if this is the correct approach, because of course, the whole transfer rules are about protecting fundamental rights, protecting individuals. And then it doesn't seem to make such a great difference if it's an individual transferring data or if it's a company transferring data. I mean, the problem for fundamental rights is always the same. So uh, it's not such a simple question. It, it really is context um, dependent. And in the end of the day, even this guidance of the European Data Protection Board is a guidance, so it's not a law, and we will have to see if the court comes back to it or if there's further discussions on it. Um, let's see. And already from what you said, I think there is also one important element that we should mention, so the interplay between personal data transfers and all the other transfers, which are also happening a lot, and the rules that you mentioned and the guidelines that you mentioned, 
I suppose they are applicable to transfers, which we can be sure that actually concern personal data. And then how would you explain to the audience uh, what is the problem, what is its significance? And are there any remedies for the difficulties related to this distinguish, uh, to the necessity of distinguishing between personal data and not personal data in this regard? Yeah, that's another excellent question. So um, the concept of personal data is um, one that is around for a while. And actually today I was looking back at the Article 29 Working Party opinion on what is personal data. Um, and it has always been defined very broadly. So it's any sort of information that can identify um, an individual um, and that the individual is considered a natural person. Um, the case law of the Court of Justice has made this whole definition even wider. So we have cases that say dynamic IP addresses could be personal data, Google search results could be personal data. So it's a very wide concept. On the other hand, the EU is now more and more regulating also non-personal data or like a mix between personal data and non-personal data, like in the Data Governance Act. Uh, and then it doesn't really define the line. So it always defines non-personal data just as data that is not personal. But that does not help much if the concept of personal data is so very, very broad. And I think it was 2018 when uh, Nadeshda Portova from then Tilburg said, um, maybe it's data protection law is becoming the law of everything. Because this concept is so wide, it seems to always apply to data, leaving not really any room for other regimes to apply. So no, there is not really a clear way of understanding when something is personal data and then you would have to apply these transfer rules and when something is not. However, the new rules on data, including on personal data, also include rules on transfers. So it's even more important now that we do understand this distinction because there is different legal regime now applying depending if it's personal data or non-personal data. I don't really know how this will uh, evolve. P potentially, we might get some case law of the Court of Justice eventually who, who will make more clear, okay, this particular one would not be personal data, this is. But at the end of the day, because personal data as a concept is very context dependent, it always depends on all the factors in an individual case. I think it's very difficult to, to make it very clear cut. And I'm also now working sometimes with computer scientists and they really despair about this very open concept of personal data. And, and they would like a list of all the things that are personal data and what is not personal data. But this is not how the law was set up. And maybe that is a problem that we need to solve. But for the moment, I don't think there is a clear cut solution. And in terms of its like the practical significance of data transfers, because when we think about digital economy, uh, how would you indicate the economic significance, the societal significance, like what in practice it means for both us as individuals and the companies that are, you know, operating within digital economy. So I think data transfers are very, very common. I don't think we have an exact number of how common because it's difficult to quantify what is a transfer. But if you just think about all the big uh, US companies that are in our lives, which is like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, etc., and how often we interact with them on a daily basis. And they're all like located in the US. And it's generally assumed that every kind of interaction you have with them, data is going to go to the US. I mean, now they're starting to try to give some guarantees that this is not the case, but generally this is most likely the case. So I think then you can already see that in your average day, you will have a lot of data transfers of your personal data as an individual to US. If you now take companies in Europe, which are relying on their cloud services or like maybe relying on Microsoft Outlook for their whole operations, which I think almost everybody does, then you see that this is really very, very, very wide spread um, in Europe. And it's not just the US. I mean, the US has these big uh, companies, but we now also see China more and more emerging as uh, like a country that has a lot of services that we use in Europe, like TikTok, um, also Alibaba. So there's a lot of things we also use. And again, this is very likely meaning that our data are transferred uh, to China. And in this context, it's also important to recall that transfer does not necessarily mean that our data goes from place A to place B, etc. It just means that our data has become accessible from a country outside of the EU. And this is, of course, a very low barrier that happens very, very easily. 
um, it, for example, if you just upload data to a cloud in principle, it becomes accessible to the cloud provider. If that's not in Europe, then you have a, a transfer. So it's a low threshold for transfer. It happens all the time. The legal rules, of course, are not applied all the time. I think they are very rarely actually applied. So there's also a huge gap between what the law says and what, what happens in practice. And in terms of our perspective as users of these services, like what would be the challenges that we encounter in terms of, uh, for example, using our rights that we technically have in this context? <laughs> yeah, that was, of course, the, the question of my my PhD. and. I mean, I think here again, you have to remember the gap between the law and what happens in reality. According to the law, um, for example, in the GDPR, there's now certain information obligations that each company has to give to us when they are transferring data. So it's one of these items listed in the information provisions in the GDPR. So they should inform us if they intend to transfer our data um, to what countries that is and what kind of tool they're using for this. And for example, if they're using a tool like standard contractual clauses, then we also should have a means to have access to the tool. And then, of course, if you get access to the filled out standard contractual clauses, at least if you're legally inclined, you can really understand what kind of transfers are going on. But in practice, this is not, it's not something that is often seen in a, in a data protection notice, for example, and also many people don't read them in the first place. So there is some, this is some offering some protection. Um, I'm not sure it works that well in practice. And then, yeah, indeed we have rights towards our data. And in theory, these rights should apply also when data are transferred, so it shouldn't matter. I mean, this is what this whole idea of securing each transfer with one of these mechanisms is kind of about. So we, you have to use one of these three legal options that are in the GDPR, adequacy, appropriate safeguards or derogations. And kind of one of their purposes is to make sure that these rights no, don't just go away just because data are transferred. However, again, in practice, I think it's it's very can be very difficult to really achieve exercising the rights. And this has different reasons. Um, one might just be in enforcement, which is a general problem of the GDPR, which has this wide scope. But how do you really enforce this scope on companies that have no subs, like no establishment in the EU at all? Like how, just in very practical terms, can you enforce something against them? Yeah, could we go a little bit deeper into these three options that you mentioned in terms of what are the grounds for actually making legal international data transfers? Because, yeah, I think it's not you know easily understandable for everybody. So uh, we have the adequacy decisions, right? And Yes, okay. So the, so the whole transfer rules functioning works as follows. You have first identified that there is a transfer and then you have to follow all the rules of the GDPR plus the additional rules um, about transfers. And the main additional rule there is that you have to find one of these additional legal crowns or additional legal basis to base your transfer on. And then indeed there are three options. The first one is adequacy, the second is appropriate safeguards and the third is derogations. For adequacy decisions, these are kind of maybe the most easy one to understand because it's the European Commission who makes an assessment of a third country or an international organization and says, okay, transferring personal data to this country is okay. It's aligned uh, with the principles that we have for the GDPR. It's protecting our fundamental rights. It's all good. Um, we have, however, very few of those decisions. So this is not always um, an option. And then the second case are appropriate safeguards, which are a number of mechanisms. I think, if I remember correctly, it's seven different options in the GDPR. And um, what they all have in common is that they are more concrete. So it's kind of the, the exporter in the EU and the importer outside of the EU finding a contractual arrangement on, on how to make sure that the basic rules of data protection in Europe are still complied with, how to make sure that there is a protection of fundamental rights in the way it is required. Um, and there, the most common one are the standard contractual clauses, which I already mentioned, so which is a contract, which is kind of a model contract drafted by the European Commission that can then be adapted to different um, situations. And then the final option, and this is designed as kind of the last fallback option um, in the GDPR, are derogations, which are specific exceptions where even without adequacy and without appropriate safeguards, you might still be able to transfer personal data, but they're really interpreted in a very narrow way, at least by the European Data Protection Board. So they're not 
very often, um, I think, an option for, for actual transfers. And what was the Schrems case about in terms of these three options that you just mentioned? Yes. So, I mean, there have been two Schrems cases to make life more exciting. And the first one was very much about adequacy. So in the first Schrems case, Schrems questioned the adequacy decision that at that point was in place for the United States. And he kind of uh, had a suspicion after Snowden, after the Snowden revelation that things in the US were in fact not aligned with European uh, fundamental rights and were not aligned with how we protect personal data in Europe. Um, so he challenged the adequacy decision and the court found that he was right. And in Schrems 1, the court also really made clear all these transfer rules, all these efforts we put to make sure they are transferred in a secure way are meant to protect fundamental rights. This is really their core objective. And the principal idea is that when data are transferred, this should only be possible if there's an essentially equivalent level of protection for fundamental rights for individuals when their personal data are processed. So this was really their core finding. Um, and it has then led to certain um, guidances and further cases in Europe because Schrems 1 was in 2015. This was just before the GDPR was finalized. Um, Surprisingly, actually, they did not change the text of the GDPR very much when it comes to transfers. They did, however, include this formulation essentially equivalent in one of the recitals, at least. Um, and then uh, fast forward, we have 2020 and we have a second Schrems decision. This time Schrems was basically questioning um, appropriate safeguards and the standard contractual clauses. Because in its original case, which was a complaint against Facebook, um, original Facebook said, yeah, we're transferring based on adequacy. After Schrems 1, they said, oh, no, we're transferring based on the standard contractual clauses. Um, so he was challenging now the standard contractual clauses. Um, in the final decision of the court, uh, the court found that the standard contractual clauses in the abstract were a, a fine tool for transferring personal data. They could, in the abstract, achieve this high level of protection. However, in this concrete case, this is something that would have to be assessed by the exporter of the data. And then the court moved on to um, look also at the new adequacy decision that at that point was in place for the US, because it said if, we, if there's an adequacy decision for the US and the standard contractual clauses are also used, then they can kind of say, okay, but the adequacy decision has found the US to be fine, so it should be fine. So they had to assess their privacy shield the new adequacy decision, and they again found it was not complying with EU fundamental rights, so they again found it was invalid. Uh, and now we are 2023, um, we just had a new draft adequacy decision for the US, uh, which was published in December, which is currently being finalized, and we probably will have another case, because as far as I know, um, Schrems and his organization, none of the business, have already announced that they most likely will challenge also this new adequacy decision. What do you think about the, the position of the commission in here? Because it is the commission who proposes the content, the content of the, of the quasi decisions, and like having read a case uh, like Schrems One's case, uh, why would they propose a quasi decision that actually infringed our rights in very similar manner? And as I understand from what you're saying about uh, the position in which we are now, probably the new proposal will also be questioned on similar merits, I suppose. So I think the European Commission is in a bit of a strange position here because there is a lot, because there are so many transfers to the US, uh, as I told before, there was like in a daily in a normal day, a lot of European people will have transferred a lot of data to the US. So this happens just all the time. There's a lot of pressure to have an adequacy decision because it's just the easiest way to transfer personal data. So I think this extreme pressure has led, for example, for the second adequacy decision to be adopted very, very quickly after the first one has kind of been eliminated by the court. Um, now that it at least took a bit more time, but indeed their final result is again, um, I don't think too distinguished from the previous ones to really hold up in front of the court. And again, I think they do this because of the economic importance of transfers from Europe to the US. And um, I think they're rightly very criticized for this because they should, I mean, the whole adequacy system only works if the European Commission is very, very strict about who gets adequacy 
and to not if we just give adequacy with the knowledge that it will be eventually invalidated by the court this kind of is not the purpose of, of this system and it doesn't really help the protection of fundamental rights and i also think that especially since rems 2 where we learned that even if a transfer is not based on adequacy but on, on the appropriate safeguards even there we still have to ensure this essential current level of protection i think also this 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 need to base everything on adequacy can really be questioned because I think it's perfectly fine to base it on uh, appropriate safeguards instead. And that's a bit more realistic because it's in a concrete transfer situation and you can make much more concrete safeguards for fundamental rights than if you have a adequate decision for a whole country where you have to really consider every possible thing that could happen to that data that comes from Europe, which is it's a really broad assessment. And I think it can only be really realistically positive for countries who are very, very similar to to Europe, and in that sense, a lot of adequacy decisions that we currently have in place probably would not withstand the scrutiny of the Court of Justice. That's not a very optimistic view. And just to make it a little bit more clear, like in terms of uh, the substantive rights that we are talking about or safeguards, what, for example, would we include in such a catalog? What the... So one thing that the court has been highlighting in both Shams cases is that individuals need to have a legal remedy to access, rectify or erase the personal data that has been accessed in that third country by governmental authorities. So if you take the case of the US, here they refer to data that has been accessed by US national security agencies under the very broad national security laws that they have in the US. And in such a situation, the court says you need to have as an individual a legal remedy and then you need to be able to access your data so you understand what kind of data they have about you. You need to be able to rectify it if it's wrong and you need to be able to erase it if they don't have any reasons to keep the data about you in the first place. And I think these are indeed the key rights that individuals should have in such situations. Of course, if you now look at the new adequacy decision for the US, these three rights at least I don't really see them in, in the new decision. They, they mentioned something about a legal remedy, but it's it's not really a remedy to get access rectification or erasure. It's a legal remedy to somehow check any access to data that has happened. But if you don't have like access to the data in the first place, you will not really know that any access has happened. So this is a kind of very strange remedy that they've now created that you can use if you have somehow a suspicion that there has been an access, but since you're not really notified about it, I really wonder how often uh, people will be able to use it. We'll need Max Schrems to <laughs> regularly <laughs> check for us, actually. <laughs> um, I also wanted to ask you, you mentioned this a little bit uh, throughout our conversation, but maybe let's sum up uh, kind of your assessment of the current legal framework and where do you see loopholes? What would you change if you were able to write new rules for international data transfers today? Then how would you do it? So um, I think that, uh, and this is also something that I confirmed in my thesis, I think that the objective of transfer rules is, is very, very sound and a very good one. It's just making sure that the fundamental rights of European individuals are not just undermined because data has gone um, outside of the EU. This makes a lot of sense if you think about how uh, economies work these days where data are just always kind of transferred or duplicated or copied. So I think this is a very important objective. I think also the, the kind of idea that you have to then make additional safeguards by using one of these three mechanisms is again, in principle, um, a, a sound idea. I don't think if you look at the three mechanisms as we have them now, maybe we need some improvements indeed. I think adequacy decision really needs to be reserved for countries who are almost similar um, than us. And also the way they are made these days, which is really a negotiation between the European Commission and the third country, is not really aligned with what the legal texts say adequacy decisions should be, which is this objective assessment by the European Commission of a third country on international organization, not the negotiation and uh, like kind of a one-sided assessment. Um, so maybe we need to be more honest about this and, and introduce the option of international agreements more explicitly. Like currently international agreements on transfers would be considered appropriate safeguards. So um, maybe we need to put more emphasis there because I think that's more really representing what happens in reality, which is this negotiation. Um, and then of course, international agreements would mean the European Parliament has a role 
which could also be very important to ensure that the quality of these decisions is better. <laughs> In general, I think also transparency about adequacy should be um, increased because currently it's it's very, very secretive. We don't know uh, why and which countries the European Commission is currently eyeing. You're, you're, in the end, um, the information for like the citizens only really starts once the European Commission publishes a draft adequacy decision. But because this draft adequacy decision is based on negotiations, there's very little room for the Commission to actually change anything after receiving public feedback. So I think that's also kind of a, a flaw in the whole system. Um, then looking at appropriate safeguards, I think um, there's options that um, we don't really know much about yet because they have not really been used, like the code of conduct for transfers or certification for transfers, which I think could be very interesting, but we will have to see now how this, this is used. And then finally, derogations. Um, I think that it's justified that they are interpreted in a very restrictive way, but however, like, I think you need to more align the way they're interpreted with the objective of protecting fundamental rights, because occasionally I think the way the European Data Protection Board interprets them does not really keep in mind that it's in the end about protecting fundamental rights. So one example is that there is this one exception is that if you can transfer data for public interest. Here, I would, for example, consider research in the public interest is like especially if it's by universities or for medical areas however this is not how how this is interpreted and they don't really think you can use like the european data protection board doesn't think you can use research for such research kind of um no the european data protection board doesn't think you can use public interest for transfers in a research context that are more than one time so if kind of in a study where you regularly exchange data this would not for the european data protection board fall under this Derogation, and I think this is also something we could reconsider, that you really target these derogations to situations where the transfer of personal data from a fundamental rights perspective can be justified because it's for a very important uh, public interest, like research. And uh, what are other examples, like what would currently be considered as you know, relevant public interest in the light of the... I like, uh, for example, a one-time transfer in the context of research could be justified, but as far as I know about research projects, usually they have more than a, a one-time transfer. So it's, it's really very limited how the EDPB sees this provision. Um, Any other conclusions from your thesis which you would like to share? Well, I think that transparency about transfers needs to be improved significantly. Um, as I mentioned before, there are provisions in the GDPR that you have to inform individuals about transfers. They are in practice never really implemented or rarely ever implemented in an appropriate manner. Um, I think this could definitely be improved and also to make sure that there's some information on how to use um, data separate rights in a transfer case. Because like the different mechanisms include also ways of like, uh, not derogations, but appropriate safeguards or adequacy decisions usually include ways of how individuals could exercise data subject rights. But this is very difficult to figure out how this is to be done. You would need to go into the text of the adequacy decision. You need to go into the text of the standard contractual clauses. I think for a normal person, this is not accessible. So this could also be included in the information obligations that they just need to tell you, okay, if you have, if you want to exercise your rights, you would have to do this and this and this. You have to go to this. Um, uh, contact details. Um, if you then want to go and complain, this would be the data protection authority. You can go to this kind of details, I think, could be much more elaborated. And then it might be more easy or would be more easy for individuals to actually use their rights. Thank you very much for this conversation. And yeah, I think we uh, managed to shed some light on the questions that one might have after hearing or seeing these headlines a couple of years ago do, about Shrimp's tool and actually expect shrimps free in the next couple of years so uh, thank you again and thank you to the audience for listening to us the lab on digital societies 